we have some we have some incredible panelists today so i won't take up too much time with opening remarks i do want to acknowledge that every year thousands of babies born in the united states are either deaf or hard of hearing and it's important for all of us to have a better understanding of some of the challenges that they face and be knowledgeable about cultural and linguistic diversity within the deaf community. So sharing with us today are Nancy Zurich, who is a retired high school educator, Janine Magnon, retired nurse, homeworker, and supervisor, Louisa Gasco Sobolewski, president of the Connecticut Association of the Deaf and retired principal of the American School for the Deaf, and Doreen Simons, American Sign Language professor. We are going to hear about some of the childhood and professional experiences that they've had and how their perspectives have played a very significant role in working with people who are deaf or hard of hearing, including supporting them and their families. And before we begin the panel discussion, I'm very pleased to introduce my co-moderator this morning, um, OPM Secretary Melissa McCaw. She serves as Vice Chair of the Council on Women and Girls, and she also is one of the tri-chairs of the leadership subcommittee of our council and she and I have co-hosted a various and wonderful array of women leaders highlighting the great work of female leaders across our state. So we're so pleased to be uh, highlighting some uh, wonderful women today. Secretary McCall, would you please make opening remarks? Thank you very much, Madam Lieutenant Governor. It is such an honor to be here with you and our tremendous panel of women leaders who are here today to help us understand and bring awareness to a very important issue. I've learned through my team that hearing loss has a dynamic range and it is not always absolute as many members of society may think. I'm learning that there is a very vibrant culture within the signing community and according to the CDC for Connecticut, about one out of five adults live with a disability. And while it sometimes may seem uncommon, hearing loss impacts over 37 million adults in the United States through birth or other means. And today we are going to learn from our friends here today about the experiences they've had growing up in homes with deaf family members. Um, and they're gonna help guide us and allow us to learn from these experiences. Two of our panelists have come from households that are multi-generationally deaf. And for others, they may have grown up being the only deaf person their family knows, especially since more than 90% of deaf children are born to hearing adults with little to no family history. We have four incredible women who come from different backgrounds and experiences. We're gonna hear about the challenges they've encountered the way their life has shaped their personal and professional lives and what they envision for the future. We're very excited because we know that there are girls and other women at different phases of their lives that need to hear about your journeys and how they can chart a course for themselves. Our panel will be showing us um, about the world that we currently live in and uh, how it's designed and how it has had cha created challenges and the steps that they took um, to work with what they were given by society and to reshape it into something that was more equitable for them. This month, we are highlighting this incredible group of women leaders and we are raising awareness. And we're very excited to learn more about their backgrounds. I wanna note that this panel is the first uh, deaf awareness panel that we've hosted, Madam Lieutenant Governor, and we hope that it will be a model for future young women and how they can too find great success in their futures. Nancy Zurich, a hard of hearing adult, grew up with a deaf sister and parents. She made her way through the public school system before devoting her career to teaching at deaf institutions. She has also had a primary focus on teaching 
the differences between sign language and English to people outside of the deaf culture. Ms. Jean Magnan is a deaf Native American. Um, she was raised in a hearing family and her compassion to help others lead led her to a career working with those with Down syndrome as well as other developmental disabilities until her retirement in 2016. She currently works with organizations within the community, helping to foster a spirit of mutual understanding. Luisa Gasco Sobolewski is a third generation deaf adult who navigated several layers of higher education to earn her undergraduate and graduate degrees before becoming a teacher at the American School for the Deaf and remains a steadfast advocate. And we have Ms. Doreen Simons, a deaf adult who is a fifth generation adult growing up with deaf parents here in Connecticut and has remained actively engaged in the community as a liaison and advocate for deaf students and youth. We look forward to hearing the insights and experiences that each of you will bring and to learn as much as we can in this short time we have together. I wanna to thank everyone who's joining us here today. And at this time, we'll turn it over to Commissioner Amy, Amy Porter from the Department of Aging and Disability Services to talk about resources and tools ADS has made available. Commissioner Porter. Thank you so much and good morning. I wanna thank you for inviting me today. It's really an honor to join our moderators and this incredible panel, particularly during Deaf Awareness Month. This annual celebration is really designed to increase awareness and advocacy, and this panel is a, a great illustration of that. The members of the panel are really just a small sampling of the incredible strong advocates that we have in our state. I have the privilege of serving as co-chair for the advisory board for persons who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. This board, for those of you who don't know, was created to advocate, strengthen, and advise um, services and advise the governor and the General Assembly, Assembly about state policies that affect this community. We are fortunate to have a number of strong advocates from the community on our board, helping us really to find a stronger path forward. In fact, one of our panelists, Louisa, is a board member um, and an incredible advocate, and I've had the pleasure of working with her for many years. In addition to my role as co-chair of the advisory board, um, as the secretary said, I am the commissioner for the Department of Aging and Disability Services, and we provide the administrative support for that board. We also have a number of state supports for the deaf community, including things like managing the interpreter registry, serving as a point of contact um, with the FCC and Pura on Connecticut's telecommunication relay services, as part of that, serving on the Relay Connecticut Board. We also administer a deaf-blind equipment distribution program and many other assistive technology supports and services. We provide specialized employment services through a cadre of rehabilitation counselors for the deaf. We provide counseling support and identify community resources for individuals and their families, provide community inclusion services for individuals who are deaf-blind, we provide technical assistance and support to our sister state agencies and to other organizations, particularly around access issues, which is a huge priority of our board. And our newest position is a human services advocate position. We're working with our advisory board to understand the needs and identify critical priorities for this position. We really appreciate the direction and support of the incredible advocates in the deaf community, including the women on today's panel. These women are amazing examples of the strength and power of advocacy and leadership. And I look forward to learning about the perspectives and the journey, um, journeys of these panel members and am happy to be with you today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner Porter and Commissioner and Secretary McCaw. Uh, it is now time to hear from our very exciting and esteemed panelists. And I want to start with Nancy Zurich. Nancy, you were born hard of hearing and attended public schools while your sister, who is deaf, attended a deaf institution. How would you compare your experience with your sisters and how did this influence your instruction at the American School for the Deaf, which I have had the great pleasure of visiting 
uh, a number of times and had the privilege of meeting some incredible students. Nancy. Okay. Um, well, having taught for 43 years at the school, um, it was really an amazing experience and I've learned so much. Um, the one thing that I was really thankful for that I was born into a, a deaf family so I could understand what was going on. Having experience in a public school, I was able to understand that viewpoint. And then having my sister here and understanding her viewpoint and my parents. My parents went to an oral school. My sister went to the deaf school at ASD and I went to a public school. So our conversation at nighttime was quite different than the usual um, situation because we had various communication. But the one thing that I found that was really, really beneficial was the community. That is very important, the community of the sameness, whether you're oral or sign or whatever, is deafness is the same. Many of the kids that I had that came to the school, they were from public schools, they were truly, the first year we had them, they were like totally lost. They did not know how to communicate. They did not know how to interact. And when they stayed at the school, after about a year, you could see their personality change and their real personality came out. And some of those kids became leader and very successful in, in life. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, to see those kids grow. And I think that's what's, what's missing in a, a lot of um, the situations is the the sameness. Okay. So. Thank you so much, Nancy. I, I wanna to turn to Jean for the next question. Jean, while you did attend a deaf institution, I understand that you grew up in a hearing family that was not part of or involved with the deaf community. Can you tell us what was required for you and your family members to communicate and to spend time with each other? And how has that shaped your personal and professional interactions at this time? She's on mute. We could stop for one second. Yeah, it, Amy, the interpreter is speaking, but we can't hear her. Um, I just wanna make sure she's, she's doing the voicing and we can't hear her and it does not look like she's on mute. So I just wanna make sure that we don't miss any of our speakers comments. Hi, everybody. Apologies. Um, we are trying to figure out on um, a video we do have one. Just apologies for the uh, miscommunication. One moment. Okay, Sarah, can you please unmute yourself and see if we can all hear you at this moment?
Okay, Sarah, can you test your microphone and Amy to see if we can hear you? Testing, can you hear me? Yes. Testing, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you. moderator. Great, I, I'm going to repeat the question to, um, for you, Jean. So Jean, we understand that you did attend a deaf institution, but you grew up in a, and you grew up in a hearing family that was not necessarily part of or involved with the deaf community. Can you tell us about what it was like for you and your family members to communicate and spend time with one another? And how has this shaped your personal and professional interactions? Sure, yes. So um, yes, I was born deaf, as you mentioned, into a hearing family. Um, you know, it wasn't something that was really encouraged. They didn't want to see, you know, uh, they didn't want to make the mistake of putting me into the wrong school. So they put me into mystic oral school so I could learn how to speak with my hearing family, relying on speech and oral reading. As I began to get older, my parents then discovered American School for the Deaf and moved me over to there. It still wasn't great. I wasn't learning sign at that point in time. Um, I had been kind of raised to speak, um, so, which does you know benefit me now where I can speak. I can lip read quite well. I did graduate from there and went on to Gallaudet University and majored in psychology and social work, which then led to how I now feel, you know, kind of a better connection with these clients that I work with that may be functionally lower where they need sign type taught to them or deaf blind clientele and that type of experience. Thank yeah. you so, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we are gonna turn to Louisa. And Louisa, you attended public schools right through your exceptional graduate level work. Tell us about your educational experience as a deaf student and uh, the impact of your family history. Hi, yes, good morning, Sue. Thank you, Susan. Um, yes, yeah, so I do come from a deaf family. Um, you know, it's really kind of, I would say, let's going back to when my mother was in an oral program growing up, my father attended a deaf school in Pennsylvania. Having me, they decided certainly that they wanted the best for me. My mother was the one who really encouraged me to work on my lip reading skills. And while growing up, mom emphasized the importance of watching people's mouth repeatedly. She was a leading deaf female in her community. And my father was as well, both of them with different paths, but both of them really having worldviews that gave me experience while growing up that then led on to my help in the future. Having gone to an oral school and then a public school prior to the time that laws were passed requiring interpreters. I'd have to sit and really work to lip read. I'd come home and I'd sign with my family and it really gave me kind of the best of both worlds during my childhood. My mother, excuse me, my father's sister, um, my aunt May, she's the one who really taught me how to kind of live in a hearing world, so to speak. With that knowledge, it helped me really to understand the difference between what deaf culture was and hearing culture, the mannerisms and such that go along with each. You know, the sounds that maybe we as a deaf family never were aware of or how certain things traveled, how manners were expected to be presented. But my aunt was really responsible for teaching me that. She would use, you know, even using a straw. Oh, be careful when you're sucking out of that straw because if you suck a certain way, it makes odd noises. Walk with your feet up, not down because of the noise that you're making with your feet down. Those are things that deaf individuals tend to do without knowledge. 
in the hearing world, there are things that aren't really looked upon normally. She was an amazing teacher and I thank her tremendously for what she was able to impart on me. When I started to work at American School for the Deaf as a teacher and then became an administrator, I remember I had a class, a specific class. A, this was a group of students who coincidentally all had deaf parents and their manners really indicated that. So I decided that a training for them was in store. They were shocked. Having deaf parents, they didn't know that there was a difference between hearing manners and deaf manners. And it was really kind of a key point to me that, you know, I really felt like I was fortunate. I had never had a problem living in both worlds, so to speak. For example, this Saturday, I'm hosting a 50th year class reunion for my high school class reunion. They will all be hearing. I have not seen them since graduation 50 years ago, and I'm planning on attending the reunion, and I will certainly figure out a way to communicate with all of them, you know? So it's really just something that I think you have to present, you have to walk in with an open mind, not feel like, you know, there's a difference, but just knowing that in one world I sign, in the other world I speak. Is my speech perfect? No, but I'm a very good lip reader. But that's depending on an individual as well. So thank you. Louisa, that's incredible. Thank, thank you so much for, um, for sharing with us your experience. I want to turn to Doreen. And Doreen, I'm going to ask you a question along those very same lines. You grew up with deaf parents, but you've had a mixture of working with deaf and hearing people in the educational and professional world. How did you prepare for and handle moving between these two environments? It's, that's very interesting. It's an interesting question. I grew up, uh, my oldest sister was hearing, Rachel Spillane, and she really was a leader in both worlds, hearing and deaf. And we had friends who would come to our house often, our hearing neighbors who we would interact with, with my sister. And so it was a very sort of um, inclusive environment where we would figure out how to communicate. And that's where I developed my sort of social skills in both the hearing and deaf worlds. Uh, my parents were wonderful, both deaf um, role models for me. My sister as well was a wonderful role model for me. My father could hear a, a little bit, not much, um, but my mother was fully deaf as was I, and that was um, generational, intergenerational in our family. And so they would both tell tales of their lives and the frustrations that they went through and their successes and their struggles and how they navigated their experiences. And that really impacted me. When I was eight or nine years old, I went to the store with my father and I was looking to, we were looking around to order something on, on one of the shelves. And my father approached someone who, or I asked my father to um, approach someone to, to ask for it. And he said, no, you do it. And I was afraid at that time because I didn't know how I would interact with him and with the sales clerk. And my father said, there are other nice hearing people and there are others that will be frustrated with you. And that's something that you need to expect. And there are some, same with deaf people. There are some um, who, who, who are nice and others that you will struggle with, but you need to be brave and, and figure out how to communicate with them. And so that was, um, that was just a funny story for me. And my, my father was always, um, he was a, a strong Irishman and he was a very funny man. And we would chat and people would often, you know, stare at us. They would see us signing and we, um, and we would say sometimes he would say to them, we are not for sale. You know, we're, we're not a commodity. People would see us and, and think it was so interesting and stare at us signing. But that was both a positive and a negative experience for me. And that was one that really impacted me. There were times um, of times that were, were difficult when I was 12 years old. Um, I wanted to become a... Um, Stewardess on an airplane. Thank you. 
And my father told me that, you know, oh, unfortunately, you have to be a really tall, beautiful woman in order to do so. And I was like, wait, what? You mean I can't do this anymore? And so it was really something where he was like, listen, you have so many things you can do. But unfortunately, there are some jobs that do require certain things, including hearing. And it was a real learning experience for me. And it was something that my mother would do the same as well. My mother's family was deaf. They had a hugely successful business. My grandparents owned a business in regards to the bread bread distributing back when I was younger. My uncle was the chairman of the city hall in regards to the cemetery. He was very successful. And I looked upon those successes and realized there were so many can-do opportunities, even at the deaf school in the area, at American School for the Deaf, I would hear these stories. I mean, living in the dorm, it was an amazing place growing up. There were deaf adults who influenced us, you know, and all these teachers and as, at Gallaudet as well, where I'd be like, I don't know what to do. And they would just have that mindset of you can. And those people became my role models and really encouraged me to know that I could. A funny story, when I graduated Gallaudet and I went on to grad school, I wanted to become a counselor. My sister was like, you gotta go to a hearing college for that because deaf school is a bit biased. There's no real experience and knowledge on these deaf counseling. How are you going to get that experience in this limited field? And I was like, oh, all right. So I conceded, ended up going to CSUN in California. And the first three months were not easy. I had been spoiled. I had been had everything accessible to me at Gallaudet. I could communicate with everyone and anyone. At CSUN, I was like, wait, I have to have interpreters. And it took me a really long time to get used to it. Afterwards, I ended up going on to New York University, got an internship and was doing both a mainstream internship and deaf school internship where I worked at RIT, managing the dorms and all of these experiences in sort of a mainstream community with both deaf and hearing individuals along with working for the BRS in Hartford for 18 years, being the only deaf individual there, really led to my ability to now be successful here at UConn. I do have some in my department these days who can sign, many who can't, and those impacts have really given me the ability to manage both worlds confidently. Thank you so much, Doreen. That's just so inspirational. And I have a follow-up question for you. Um, You've had a lot of experience with students and you've served as president of the parent advisors at the American School for the Deaf. Can you talk about how your own life experiences have helped you uh, when you work with students and parents? Certainly. Um, I volunteered for almost 18 years at the uh, deaf camp Isola Bella in Connecticut um, for their weekends and parents weekend. And many parents would come to us having no idea really how to have a relationship with their deaf child. A mother um, of the mother of Jeff Braven, they had just come um, for the parents weekend and we explained um, and, and counseled them and advised them about how they could interact with their with their deaf children. And they would come back um, over and over again over time and learn more about deaf, the deaf community and deaf culture and the American School for the Deaf. And the families were able to get involved on those weekends and interact with other parents who of deaf children. And that was really influential because it helped them parents see um, that they, that they, the deaf children could do so much more than they necessarily thought. And they didn't need it to be encouraged, uh, discouraged by feeling that they could only speak, um, only learn to speak or read lips. I had a parent who came to me and- With their son and their son was not able to communicate with their parents, but saw me speaking to my daughter and came up and started signing. The parents were totally shocked. They were like, he doesn't know how to sign. And we showed them that actually he really did. So the parents then went on to decide to take ASL classes and had much better communication with their child because of that experience. 
you know, having worked in this experience for 18 years here now at UConn, I always tell my students, I'm not teaching sign for me. I'm teaching sign for the communicate for the community in order to really allow access for these children who need it. You know, and I do share some of my experiences and some great stories to each of my classes, especially in regards to my social linguistics class, the multicultural in a deaf community, socialization classes. Explaining those things to the community really helps them have a better understanding and become more aware. You know, obviously we take advantage of deaf awareness each year. COVID has kind of taken that from us recently, but it was a great opportunity for us to speak and have kind of a role play opportunity within our classrooms, which is a great experience that often it really does have a lot of influence on each of my students, so. Doreen, thank you, thank you so much, Louisa. I'd like to turn to you, I, uh, recognizing that you have been a teacher at the American School for the Deaf, um, but we also wanna acknowledge the great amount of time that you spent doing advocacy. What do you think are some of the positive changes we have seen since you were growing up compared to your grandchildren and where do we need to improve? Really, I have lived through change through all of these years. And before, you know, when there was no captioning on the TV, for example, I would guess, um, you know, that there were not interpreters and you would have to guess to fill in the blank. And my father was, was wonderful at that. Um, making phone calls, we didn't use, um, we didn't use phones in the same ways where there were no interpreters, no interpreted phone calls. So we went from really having nothing in terms of accessibility to, I've seen things change so dramatically in my lifetime as the years have gone by um, with the law of the ADA passed um, and other laws that have ensured that we have communication access for our children in schools through interpreters or captions or assistive technology. And when I first moved to Connecticut, I was very proud because Connecticut was the first state in the country where we had a one-stop center where there were services for deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind. Um, and that was in 1975. And I, so I was thrilled to live here because I felt that there was everything that a deaf person could need. Um, in the hospitals, for example, the children born in, in, in deaf hospital, it was normal for there to be, I mean, I'm sorry, in Hartford Hospital, it was normal for there to be interpreters there um, for the entire day. And so they were able, deaf people were able to thrive with those um, accessibility measures. At, in my time, when I saw my children, they had interpreters, my, my children grew up, they had interpreters um, in their school system. They were able to text uh, with, their, with their friends. And so the changes in technology have been tremendous. But still, of course, there remain some issues that we see today. Uh, we don't have a one-stop center any longer um, for deaf and hard of hearing, deafblind services, and certain um, issues have arisen as a result of that. And um, there are other procedures that, that we, we could benefit from having more standardization in procedures and programs in hospitals, police stations, um, awareness and accessibility with fire departments and these other social services. There are so many, um, there are still some, so many gaps and there are concerns for our next generation still because when there was one place where you could have information and navigate um, all of these different realms, that was critical for us. And so my job at CAD, the Connecticut Association for the Deaf, I'm the president there. My, my job is really to make sure that all deaf, hard of hearing and deaf blind citizens have appropriate accessibility um, in their daily lives so that they feel safe and comfortable and confident and they can trust that they're not, because that's the essential part that we've lost right now is the trust in our system. And so that's something that I really wanna push for in the future so that um, my three and four grand grandchildren who are deaf can see, um, can have the, the benefits of those types of programs in schools. But I, I always say, um, there's, there's room for improvement. There have been tremendous improvements, but there's always room for improvement and I'll be working. Um, I looked up to my parents who were leaders at the, in their time 
And in the same way that they fought for their rights, um, we are still having to fight for ours. And I, I, we will not give up until those barriers are overcome and we will fight diligently. And so I tell my children the same thing, that that's, that's an intergenerational fight we will have to do, uh, we will have to undertake to, to combat the um, oppression uh, of inaccessibility. And deaf people can do truly anything except for here. That is, that is something, our, a motto of ours, that we can truly do anything except here. We can become administrators of, the, of deaf schools. And that's essential because then we're able to influence younger children to believe that, that like us, they can do anything that they want to do. And that's something that my parents always instilled in me. You can do what it is that you want and you can become a teacher, you can become an administrator. And now I'm retired and I'm still fighting to advocate for the community. And that's not something that I will ever give up. Thank you so much uh, for that. We're gonna turn to Jean. Um, we wanna go in a little bit of a different direction because one thing that we've learned about Jean is she is an avid and accomplished photographer and artist. And so I would like Jean to talk about how these hobbies came about and um, maybe she could talk about some of her creative influences and the perspective that she gets from uh, being an artist and a photographer. I, I always wanted to become a photographer. That was something that was fascinating to me. It was, it was really different and I felt you could see the world differently um, through, through a camera lens, through the earth, the flowers, um, waterfalls, nature. I, that was always something that I enjoyed taking pictures. And so I try to, you know, make something that look good, looks good and that, that makes me feel proud um, of myself for having, having taken it. So that's sort of my view on that. I'm still do, I'm still doing photography. I'm still learning. It's an ongoing process. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean. I want to turn to Nancy. And Nancy, we've noted that you have worked as an educator on both the collegiate and theatrical levels, assisting aspiring professionals to understand and sometimes decode the cultural and linguistic differences between American Sign Language and English. And since we've spoken a lot about communication today, I was hoping you could tell us about the cultural and linguistic differences between American Sign Language and English um, and uh, to help us avoid making mistakes in the future. What are some of those differences? Wow, okay. There is, there is a big difference between the two. And now I'm signing and talking at the same time, which means I'm doing English. So I'm going to switch, not talk. So I'm going to have an interpreter. So when I'm signing an ASL, it is a different language than when I'm speaking English. Um, for example, in a classroom setting, if I was to sign something in ASL and then convert and speak it in the spoken English language and kind of alternate back and forth, I, it would be beneficial. The reason being that I had students you know, in the class that didn't know how to sign and then I also had some students in the class that did not know ASL. So I would really have to kind of go back and forth between both languages throughout my teaching. You know, and that was really an important piece. Um, I think that the reason for that is because, well, you know, many students tend to feel more comfortable in their primary language, whatever that may be. Um, you know, and, and 
they may not even know. So the big piece of that would be, you know, for a teacher to expose both, do the signing in ASL, but also ensure that I'm speaking English as well. Um, and to be honest, sometimes, you know, it was successful and other times it was not. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, it always, as everything else, depends on each individual student. And I do find that now, you know, there are some people who really just don't understand English and um, they do have to have ASL only. And then others that, you know, may understand English, but may not understand ASL at the same time. So, you know, it really does become a, a communication issue. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy. We understand that you also like to travel and enjoy experiencing other countries and cultures. What do you think we can learn from other cultures, particularly with respect to inclusion of people who are deaf or hard of hearing? Well, I have gone to many different places. Um, you know, I've visited many schools. And, you know, I do have to say, we really do have hold, hold the rein in leadership here. We lead the way. So, you know, we really do lead the way as far as how to approach it. But of course, we do still have more, you know, that we need to do, of course. Um, I think most importantly, um, would be that we really give the deaf community and deaf individuals the leadership roles, you know, as long as we provide them with leadership roles, that's key. And, you know, kind of allow them to then take it on and lead the way for us. instead of kind of going behind, you know, where we're behind, you know, allow them to be the ones to lead and us follow their lead. Thank you for that, Nancy. The, the work of the Council on Women and Girls that I co-chair with the Lieutenant Governor is focused precisely on that and ensuring that um, our, our leaders are representative of our population. And that includes women leaders and, and should also include um, women leaders um, who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, because clearly today, as I listen to the four of you, you bring a perspective that a hearing person um, might overlook. So I'm so thankful, so thankful for your leadership. I wanna move in a slightly different direction with Jean. Jean, you spent your career working with individuals with service and advocacy needs. How do you think your life's experiences impacted your level of care for the people you worked with and the people that you advocate for? You know, I worked at a group home, um, so not, uh, I wasn't a nurse, so I just wanna clarify that before we proceed. Um, but in my experience there, I worked in this group home for almost 30 years, and I did work with a dip, about eight different clients, um, ranging from nonverbal all the way to, I did have two deaf individuals, and my, I would basically be working on teaching them how to kind of do household chores or, you know, things that are much different from like a training, you know, where you're living in an institution in a dorm um, and you're kind of raised at, in one way, that dorm shuts down and they end up being moved into these group homes. And I was given the responsibility to teach them how to live a normal home life, so to speak. How do you cook? How do you read? Um, 
you know, using visual cues was often something that I relied on. A uh, picture of flour, a picture of the measuring cups and how to measure out the flour. Teaching them their kind of everyday routines, how to do laundry, um, you know, cleaning their rooms even. It's things, you know, that at other times I would have to take them to doctor's appointments, drop them off at work and kind of even recreational experiences. Encouraging communication. Um, and, you know, imparting that knowledge on them and teaching my staff the same thing as well. Um, so it went pretty well. I, I'm pretty fortunate for having that experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I want to turn to Louisa, who we understand likes to attend UConn women's basketball games. So uh, tell us how you experience the energy and the excitement of the arena, uh, which is home to the best uh, female basketball team in the country at the collegiate level. And we're so proud of them and we're curious. It's always exciting for me, to be honest, anytime I go to a game there. I feel like I'm part of a community. I have made a lot of friends with people who just happen to be sitting next to me. I've gone with groups of deaf friends as well. We'll go out to dinner and, you know, especially with my husband and I, we both have a great relationship with the athletic director at UConn um, in, and actually several of the athletic directors. One of them, Lou Perkins, who now has since transferred to Kansas, happened to be friends with a friend of my, someone that I've known from out in Washington, D.C., and currently, the current athletic director is wonderful. Every time we're at a game, if we're there, he stops by and says hello to us. And even the coach, Gino, um, has, is a friend of ours, I would say. You know, he has come up to us and apologized. I'm sorry, I don't know how to sign. But he uses some gesturing. We always have interpreters with us, fortunately, if we are there for a big event. Um, you know, if it's something that is sponsored by UConn. Um, a sporting event of some sort. My son played track, ran track for UConn years ago and people there at UConn were awesome. You know, whether it was at the Hartford Civic Center or at, up at Gamble's Pavilion, I can't say enough. I feel like I'm part of the community regardless of the fact that I am deaf. I am a cheerleader. I have the spirit and I hold the pride, especially for our women's team. And I'm hoping for this year to be the year. <laughs> Let's get on that 12th championship. <laughs> Louisa, we are, we are hoping the same as well. Ladies, before we close, we'd love to hear from each of you about what you would tell a, a deaf young girl now based on your life's experiences. Doreen, we're gonna start with you given your experience working with children in that camps. What is, what is the message for our young girls that are listening to you here today? You know, I do, like you said, work with deaf children, several of them, and have over the years, girls and boys both. The one thing I've always focused on is maintaining that positive experience that was influenced upon me from my parents that I have also imparted on my own children. And now my daughter has been able to kind of impart on her own friends as well. You know, I recall a young girl from years ago saying to me, oh, I really want to work on a rocket ship, but they said I couldn't. And my answer was no, there are so many jobs that go along with working on a rocket ship that you could do. And shockingly, she was like, what? And here she is today, currently working for NASA. Influencing these girls to know that they can is so important. And that is something, again, they think you can't. And sure, are there gonna be some things that you know they do have restrictions for, based on their hearing limitations? Yeah, but with technology and the abilities that we are being given to provide more accessibility today, it's not what it was before. So looking at me, I do think some kids will say, how did you get where you are? And I simply say repeatedly, you can, because the word you can't should not be ever said to them. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Louisa, what's your advice? You know, I have been working in the school system for years. And currently at this moment, I'm actually in Framingham, Massachusetts, and I'm working as an advocate here in a middle school level as a co-principal for a temporary position. I am working currently with a younger community and even obviously including some girls, but anywhere I see young girls, my important message is you can, as Doreen said, you know, even before, when I was a principal at American School for the Deaf, I'd have students come in and say, oh, Ms. Sobolewski, I don't know if I'm able to. And my response is, I believe you can, regardless of what color, what, whatever the case may be, whether you're deaf, young, and you're a female, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever, everyone needs to know you can be successful. And I am a strong believer in the fact that every young girl may have different needs and their interests may vary. No one person is the same as the next, but no matter what, it's important that we believe in them. Here, working as Connecticut, as their, the Connecticut Agency for the Deaf President, I think it's important that we encourage young women to become part of our group. And I'm always willing to work with them as their mentor and encouraging them to get to move forward. We have to give back. You know, it doesn't matter who they are or where they're from or their family history, if they're from the islands or whatever the case may be, you're always welcome. And it's something that my parents really taught me. It's important to encourage young people, even if they're from hearing families, growing up, they'd be at my house as well. It's important to support young people and make sure they know they can and remind them repeatedly that not only that they can, but they will. Thank you so much, Louisa. Jean, what is your advice? Just a second, sorry. Let me just make some adjustments here. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, if I were to give advice to a young girl today, it would be to set a goal, to get educated, and to find a job they like. You know, I think those things are important. And you know, if you do those things, it will certainly allow them to have a good life. And it's important to have that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jean. And lastly, Nancy, you have the parting words to the girls and young women who are out there who are, who are watching. I always would tell the kids, why not? Why not? Try it. You don't know until you try it. And they would be like, hmm, why not? So that would be mine. Why not? Go for it. I, I love it. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you so much to all of our incredible pa panelists. We're so fortunate that you've all joined us to share your insights and your experience and your uh, words of wisdom. We so appreciate it. We also want to thank our interpreters who did a great job, Amy Corey and Sarah Labella. You ladies are very impressive. We appreciate your help and your service today. And we thank all of our guests who joined us uh, to honor and recognize Deaf Awareness Month. And special thanks to Melissa McCaw and the OPM team who brought this panel together. We appreciate your partnership and uh, we love highlighting women leaders in our beautiful state. So thank you all so much for helping us do that. Bye everybody.